bit of review of, of what I covered in the last few minutes of the last lecture. Uh, we are uh, thinking about the uh, Stark effect in hydrogen and alkali atoms. Stark effect concerns the behavior of, uh, of, of atoms in the presence of uh, electric fields. And uh, we're taking the case of the hydrogen and the alkali atoms because these are uh, single electron atoms, so it's a matter of a simplicity to do that. Of course, in the case of the alkalis, that's only an approximation. We're approximating the core electrons by means of a, a charge cloud, which we assume is a rotationally invariant. Uh, but in any case, this gives us a, a central field Hamiltonian for both cases, uh, where the uh, potential, we call it potential V naught of R, meaning it's the unperturbed potential. Uh, in the case of hydrogen, of course, we have a formula for the potential that comes from the Coulomb uh, potential in the nucleus. In the case of the alkali, there is no formula for it, uh, no simple formula anyway, uh, but the idea is that there's a screen charge, which is a function of position, and it goes to the pole as uh, unscreened charge of the nucleus as R goes to zero, and it goes to a charge of, of just um, plus one as the electron moves to infinity, leaving just the ion behind. Um, Okay, uh, so I think that's the uh, basic setup which I discussed last time. Now, in both cases, whether it's the hydrogen uh, potential or whether it's the alkali potential, they, the curve of the, the potential, potential energy curve has a function of radius, what's so qualitatively the same in both cases. It goes to zero as the radius goes to infinity, and it goes to minus infinity as the radius goes to zero. Actually, here I plot the potential not as a function of radius, but rather as a function of the coordinate z along the z-axis. So there's a negative side to it as well, and the potential is insymmetric about the two. And I've indicated schematically some of the uh, some of the bound states that's in, that's in this potential. All right, so that's the kind of the setup of the unperturbed system. Now, um, the uh, uh, the um, before we start doing perturbation theory in, in any, under any circumstances, it's always a good idea to uh, understand the unperturbed system very thoroughly. That means uh, knowing it's uh, the energy levels, its uh, eigenfunctions, and the degeneracies. So let me just uh, summarize all of that. If we talk about the two cases, hydrogen and the alkali, they're slightly different. For hydrogen, if we got the Hamiltonian, well, the energy eigenfunctions are, are central force eigenfunctions. So I'll write them in cat language as NLM, the, uh, the three quantum numbers. By the way, we're neglecting the spin here, so there's no spin quantum number. Uh, in the case of hydrogen, the energy level depends only on the principal quantum number. So that comes out. And that energy level, E n, is the usual hydrogen energy level. It's 1 over 2 n squared. And then the energy itself is these, like, the, the, the factor that gives it dimensions of energy is E squared over A naught. That's about uh, 26 electron volts. Uh, <coughs> so that's what it is in hydrogen. Uh, there's also a degeneracy. These are degenerate. And the order of the degeneracy is n squared in the case of hydrogen. In the case of the alkali, if we let uh, uh, the, let the Hamiltonian act in the eigenstate, we get an energy that depends on both the N and L quantum numbers, although naturally not the magnetic quantum number. Uh, there is no formula for energy E and L. You can't write a formula for it. Uh, but you can uh, certainly say what the degeneracy is. It's 2L plus 1 coming from the fact that the energy doesn't depend on the magnetic quantum numbers. I think all this should be kind of reviewed. Uh, if we talk about hydrogen, we have a typical, uh, the standard energy level diagram for that. There's the 1s level is the ground state, 2s is the first excited state, is degenerate with 2p. Above that is the 3s, degenerate with 3p, which is degenerate with 3d. So this is, it goes on up. So this is what it looks like in the case of hydrogen. And in the case of an alkali, I'll give you just an example of sodium. The ground state is the 3s. Uh, Somewhat above that is the 3p, and then above that is the 3d. Uh, somewhere over here is a 4s, then there's a 4p up here somewhere, and so on. It makes uh, bubbles that look like this. Uh, this is at least some of the uh, low line levels of sodium, looks like that. And uh, you see the sodium levels, uh, the energies uh, are uh, uh, do depend on the uh, angular momentum quantum over L. All right, so that's kind of the setup of the unperturbed system. Now, uh, next we want to turn to the perturbation. Uh, the perturbation, let me do it over here. Perturbation is that there's going to be an electric field in the z direction. I'm going to use the letter F instead of E for electric field, so it's not to confuse it with energy. Uh, let's write F uh, is equal to the magnitude of F in the z direction, so this is the electric field. This means the electrostatic potential is minus F times Z, and it means the 
potential that appears in the Hamiltonian, I'll call it V1, you can also call this H1, it's the same as perturbing Hamiltonian, is the charge on the electron, which is minus E times phi, and so this becomes plus EFC, is the, is the perturbation. <coughs> okay, so that's just writing down the formula for it. Now, if I sketch the perturbation on the z-axis, it's just a straight line in z, and it kind of comes through like this from the origin and goes down like that. So this is the v1. And if we add the unperturbed potential to the perturbation, I'll draw it in a dotted line. Since v0 goes to 0 as z goes to infinity, it asymptotes to the v1 line, and then comes down like this. So the idea is that at small radii, the Coulomb potential dominates. But if you go out far enough, the actually V1 is kind of not a perturbation anymore. It's larger than V0 if you go far enough out because V0 goes to zero. On the other side, it's going to do this. It'll add these two curves together. You get a curve that, again, asymptotes to the V0 line, has, has a maximum like this, and then goes down like this and approaches the Coulomb potential. So I hope you can see my dotted lines there. You can see that the per perturbation is introducing asymmetry between plus C and minus C, and that uh, in the, on the downhill side here, there's, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a hill, there's a potential, a hill like this, with a maximum right about there. The maximum potential is a place where the force is zero, but physically what that point means is, is that it's a place where the uh, electric force pulling the electron towards the nucleus is exactly balanced by the force from the applied field which is pushing it the other way, so the force is zero. It's an unstable fixed point for the position of the electron. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, there's a question about the orders of magnitude of the various electric fields that appear here. Of course, this depends on how strong an applied electric field we, we apply, uh, but let me just say some things about that. Uh, if you ask for a typical electric field uh, produced in, inside an atom, in effect, a, a, an atomic unit of electric field, uh, a reasonable choice for that is the electric field seen by the uh, hydrogen, uh, the electron in the hydrogen atom in its ground state, that is to say at, at a bore radius. And if you work that out, let's call this the electric field uh, produced by the nucleus or the atomic electric field, let's call it the atomic, uh, half atomic here. What is that equal to? If you work out the numbers, it comes out to about 10 to the 9 volts per centimeter. Uh, this is uh, actually easy to see because the ionization potential is 13 electron volts. And that's the energy the electron has to gain on moving approximately an angstrom. So putting the numbers together, it comes to about 10 to the 9 volts per centimeter. This is a very strong electric field by ordinary standards. In laboratories, you hardly ever get more than about 10 to the 4th or 10 to the 5th uh, volts per centimeter. It's kind of dangerous getting much more than that. Uh, so uh, we can take the applied electric field, you know, for the sake of thinking of laboratories, being something like 10 to the 5th, maybe 10 to the 5th max volts per centimeter. The main point is that it's much less than the atomic field. And what that means is, is that in such, a, such an applied laboratory field, down here for these low-lying uh, energy eigenstates, they're actually not affected very much by the applied field, it's just a small perturbation. However, you can see, since, since the, the energy eigenstates pile up, there's an infinite number of them that pile up near E equals zero, you can see that some of them, in fact, an infinite number of them, are going to be above this, uh, this, this, this top of this barrier here. And in fact, they're not going to even exist as bound states anymore when you turn on the perturbation because they're free just to go on out. There's, there is no potential binding them anymore. Um, actually, even the bound states, even the ground state, which is somewhat way down in this well, uh, even that no longer is, strictly speaking, a bound state when you turn on the perturbation. And the reason is, is that this potential energy curve, if I can continue to dot the line on down here, goes arbitrarily far down. It may be a weak field compared to the atomic field, but if you go far enough out, you can build up uh, an overall voltage drop as large as you want. And so, for example, this bound state of the unperturbed system now has the ability to tunnel through this barrier, come out into the real world here, and get the travel away going on out. And what that means is that when you turn on this perturbation uh, right here, turn on this perturbation H1, is that, strictly speaking, all of the bound states of the hydrogen atom actually become, uh, become uh, resonances, and there's now a continuous spectrum. This is really like a scattering problem of the type that was, that was analyzed in an earlier Homer problem in WKD theory, where you had a wave coming in, a barrier, and then bound states inside. However, the time that it takes to tunnel through this, this barrier here may be very large. In WKD theory, you, uh, you find out that the uh, tunneling uh, probability is exponentially small in the action. And as you go deeper and deeper down, or if the field gets weaker and weaker, so this 
curve becomes more and more shallow. It's got a longer distance to tunnel through. And for the ground state, it's something that might be beyond the age of the universe before it would ever uh, tunnel out and escape. In any case, from a, you can see a lot of things from just a qualitative standpoint by just drawing the potential energy curves without doing any calculations. One of the interesting features about this tunneling is that there's no evidence of it in the perturbation theory that we're going to be doing. The perturbation theory doesn't show that tunneling. You have to do a different kind of analysis to get that. Anyway, this board here is kind of the set of the problem with the Stark effect and these two, uh, these two uh, kinds of the systems, hydrogen and, and alkalis. All right. Now, uh, <clears throat> we're going to do a bounce state perturbation theory study, amongst other things, the shifts in the energy levels due to this perturbation. Uh, the perturbation theory is roughly divided into the degenerate and the non-degenerate types, of which the non-degenerate is simpler. So let's talk about the non-degenerate perturbation theory first. I'm going to bring this board back again. That means that we need to, uh, uh, we need to study uh, unperturbed energy levels which are non-degenerate. This would include the ground state of hydrogen, which is uh, non-degenerate because it's n equals 1, so n squared is 1. Uh, and it would include any of the s levels of the alkalis, if 5s is up here, 2, or for which 2l plus 1 is equal to 1. <coughs> it does not include the, the higher excited s levels of hydrogen because they're degenerate with a higher angular momentum space. This is, this is extra degeneracy in hydrogen here. So to, just to take a case, let's take the ground state of hydrogen and just analyze that first, or, or maybe later we'll look at these S states and alkalis. So we can do non-degenerate perturbation theory and see what happens. So the basic result in non-degenerate perturbation theory, let's say we're talking about the ground state of hydrogen. Let's call it delta P, delta 100. Those are the NLM quantum numbers of the state that we're, uh, that we're perturbing. So it's the ground state here. And I'll put a 1 here to indicate first order perturbation theory. The basic result is, is that the energy shift is the expectation value of the perturbing Hamiltonian with respect to the unperturbed eigenstate. So here it's going to be uh, 1, 0, 0, sandwiched by the perturbation, which you see up there is ESZ, like this, 1, 0, 0. And E and F are constants, which we can take out. And basically what's left is the matrix element of the coordinate Z with respect to the ground state. Well, this uh, matrix element vanishes. Um, and it does so uh, because of, basically because of parity. Uh, the ground state is an eigenstate of parity uh, because uh, some of the force uh, eigenfunctions are always eigenstates of parity. The parity is minus 1 to the L. It's a useful rule, rule to remember for atomic problems. But in any case, it's the same parity on both sides. Uh, whereas Z is the component of the position operator, which is odd under parity. And uh, so uh, the position operator can only connect together states that have opposite parity, and the result is zero. And so there is no uh, energy shift at first order in the ground state of hydrogen. If we go to the uh, S states of the alkalis, it's going to be the same story. Now the, the, energy, now the state's going to be N00 zero zero instead of 100, zero zero, but the basic matrix element is, is the same, sandwiching Z amongst between those two. And the basic fact remains that the two states on the two sides are eigenstates of parity, and so the answer has to be zero. So there is no, uh, as we say, there is no linear Stark effect. Linear Stark effect means a, uh, an energy shift at first order perturbation theory. There is no linear Stark effect in any of these non-degenerate states here, here, and there, like that. Okay. Now, um, the... Um, but uh, to give you a little bit of a physical interpretation of this, let me say some things about, about electric dipole moments. In, uh, in classical uh, electrostatics, uh, a dipole moment vector, let me call it D, uh, is determined by a charge distribution, and it's basically just the position weighted, uh, just a charge, excuse me, charge weighted position. So if I have a continuous charge distribution rho of R, I just multiply it by the vector R, the integrate over all space. And this is the definition of classical dipole moment vector. Now, to interpret this in a quantum problem, we might want to take the charge density of the classical problem and replace it by the charge in the electron, which is minus E, multiplied by the probability density of the electron, like this. And if we just make that substitution in this integral, then we get a new integral, which can be written like this. It becomes d cubed r. And then we've got psi of r complex conjugated. And then in the middle, we have minus E times r. And then they've got psi of r on the other side. That's just making a substitution into the integral. And you see, and you see in doing this, it becomes an expectation value. 
of an operator, which is minus E times R. In the quantum mechanics, we call this operator minus E times R, we call this the dipole moment operator, as distinct from the dipole moment vector of numbers that appears in classical mechanics. Uh, um, it's a very similar idea, obviously, because here's the charge and there's the position. It's a charge-weighted position. I might add that if you have more than, this is just for a single electron. If you have a, uh, a system with more than one charged particle, then this gets replaced by the sum of the particles of the charges times the position vectors like this. It's a charge-weighted position. But in any case, what we have here, then, is the expectation value now with respect to the state psi of the, uh, of the dipole moment operator. Now notice that if we take the z component of this, we get the expectation value of z, which is the same expectation value that's been appearing here in this, in this calculation of the first order energy shift, which that turned out to be zero because of parity. And so, again, my parity, if this state psi of r is an energy eigenstate, which is also an eigenstate of parity, uh, then the answer will be zero, and as we say, there would be no linear Stark effect. Another way to say the same thing is, is to say that there's no permanent electric dipole moment. If there's a state psi of R, normally one thinks of an energy eigenstate here, if there's a state psi of R such that, such that this integral is non-zero, then we say there is a permanent electric dipole moment. It's a non-zero expectation value of this. So these two things go hand in hand, the linear Stark effect and existence of a um, of, a, uh, of a permanent electric dipole moment. Now, um, we can be more general than just these special cases of non-degenerate states, the hydrogen 1s and the alkali ns states. In fact, we can generalize this to, uh, I mean, one might ask whether this result of the vanishing of this expectation value is due to the simplicity of our model here, where we neglected spin and relativistic effects and all kinds of things. Or maybe if we took a more complicated system with multi-particle multi systems, maybe they have nuclear forces, you know, all kinds of things. Maybe we find this, this, this expectation value would be non-zero. Well, if we restrict ourselves to non-degenerate states, the answer is that won't happen. And the reason is, is that if you have a non-degenerate energy eigenstate, and we're dealing with a Hamiltonian, a perturbed Hamiltonian H0, which is isolated, then that Hamiltonian commutes with parity this is a parity operator, in fact, to a very good approximation. The only approximation is the neglect of the weak interactions, which in ordinary, ordinary circumstances are, are really extremely small. So for all practical purposes, almost all practical purposes, H naught can be used with parity. And if we have a non-degenerate eigenstate of H naught, then we have a theorem that went back to our very first lecture, or the very first week of lectures, that said that it's going to also, because parity, parity can use with H naught, it will also be an eigenstate of parity. And so whatever the state psi is, it's an eigenstate of parity. If parity is the same on both sides, this is out of the parity, and the thing is zero. Now this applies actually to much more general situations than just these two uh, hydrogen and alkali that we're talking about. At least for non-degenerate energy eigenstates. All right, uh, and uh, the um, and the uh, uh, and the uh, basic rule here is, is that there's no permanent electric dipole moment either for these states. Now uh, it seems evident from this uh, analysis so far that if we want to find a, a first order energy shift, we're going to have to look at degenerate states and start to start to do degenerate perturbation theory. So there's two obvious choices for degenerate states. We can take some of these alkali states, the 3p, for example, or 3d, which have a degeneracy of 2l plus 1. Or we can take some of the hydrogen states, which have a higher degeneracy, namely n squared. So for simplicity, let's take the alkali states first, because the degeneracy is not as big. So when I think of a 3p state of the alkali, for example. Now here in degenerate per perturbation theory, the basic result is, is that the shifts in the energy levels are the eigenvalues of the uh, perturbing Hamiltonian inside the degenerate eigenspace of the unperturbed, of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. What is the degenerate eigenspace of, let's say, the excited space of the alkali, 3p, for example? Well, these have the form NLM, and the degeneracy comes because of the magnetic quantum number. They don't depend on, on M, but they do depend on N and L. And so the matrix elements that we want to consider are the perturbing Hamiltonian H1, sandwiched between states that look like this, NL, M on one side, NLM on the other side, and I'll put a prime on one of the Ms. I notice where the primes occur. The, the N and the L are not prime because they identify the unperturbed, uh, 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 the unperturbed uh, eigenspace 
eigenspaces that only appear in the Hamiltonian. The M and the M prime are prime because they represent the basis inside that eigenspace. So letting M, prime, M and M prime run over all possible values, this is a matrix which has a dimension of 2L plus 1. And then we have to diagonalize that and find the shifts in the energy levels of first order. That's the rule of degenerate perturbation theory. Well, before we start to worry about diagonalizing a big matrix, um, we don't need to actually do very much work. And the reason is, is that for central force Hamiltonians, these, these, uh, these central force eigenstates are again eigenstates of parity. It depends only on the L quantum number, and it's minus one of the L. But in particular, it's going to be the same on both sides. H1, on the other hand, is still the same, the same H1. It's EFZ, and Z is odd in the parity. And so, in fact, the entire matrix is zero for the same reason as before. It's actually by parity once again. So parity kills this. And the result is that there's no linear Stark effect in any of the excited states of the alkalis. So where are we going to find a first-order Stark effect? Well, it's clear that we're going to, first of all, have to have, to have a degenerate energy level. And secondly, it's going to have to be one that mixes together, combines together states of opposite parity. And where do we find such a thing? The answer is we only find it one place in the, in the kind of real universe of problems, and that's the hydrogen atom, where you have the, the degeneracy between the different L, L values. For example, the, you see the parity is a function of L. The S states are even, the P states are odd, the B states are even, and so on, and the parity. So just looking at the N equals 2 levels, we've got even and odd states that are, that are degenerate with each other. So therefore, we can expect a, um, a first order Stark effect in the um, n equals 2 levels of hydrogen. And that's what I'd like to analyze now uh, by degenerate perturbation theory. So uh, I guess I have to raise some things now. They ought to have all physics lecture halls with boards that are all the way around so that somebody could just start going all the way around. All right, anyway. Um, Anyway, let's take a look at this, at this, this level here. This is the n equals 2 level of hydrogen that has 2 squared equals 4 states. There's 1 here, and there's 3 there. And what are these states? Let's list them up this way. This is going to be in the notation NLM. So the four states are, first of all, 2, 0, 0. That's the 2s state. And then there's the 2, 1, 0, the 2, 1, 1, and the 2, 1, minus 1. Are they, these are the three states of the 2p, 2p level, like this. And we need this. So we're going to have a 4 by 4 matrix. So let me just uh, set it up like this. I'll write Kets across the top row, and I'll write bras, bras down, the, down, the, down the column here. So this is 2, 0, 0, uh, 2, 1, 0, uh, 2, 1, 1, and the 2, 1, minus 1, like this. So we're going to have a big 4 by 4 matrix like this. And we want to sandwich around this the perturbation, which is EFC. This is the H1. <coughs> All right. So here's what our matrix elements are going to look like. They're going to be N, L, M. And then we've got Z, and I'll take the EF out, because it's a constant. And then N, L, M on the other side. And I'm going to prime the L and the M on the first side, because those are allowed to be different from the L and M on the other side. However, the N is the same because that la labels the, uh, the, uh, the eigenspace, uh, the degenerate eigenspace of the unperturbed system. All right. So there's 16 matrix elements to fill out here, and they all have this form. So what you should do in a case like this is start looking at selection rules to see when the matrix element is going to be zero. And uh, in fact, what you've got here is uh, something to which the bigger Eckhart theorem applies. Because the Z is in fact the is a T10, it's a Q equals zero uh, component of a of a <coughs> tensor operator, namely the vector operator for the, the position, position vector. And um, so this has got a Q equals zero. So as usual with the bigger Eckhart theorem, there's two types of selection rules. One involves the angular momentum. And the angular momentum, according to the bigger Eckhart theorem, you've got to you know, have delta L, the difference in the, between L and L prime can either be equal to 0 or plus or minus 1. Those are the rules for addition of angular momentum. There's also a magnetic quantum number rule that says that m is equal to m prime, or m prime equals m, because q is 0. So those are the selection rules, and the matrix element is guaranteed to vanish unless those conditions hold. Uh, this is coming from the bigger eckhart theorem, which concerns the symmetry under, under uh, proper rotations. 
If we throw a parity into the mix, however, there's an additional selection rule which says that delta L has to be odd because you have to change the parity of the states. And so the zero goes away, and what we end up with is just delta L equals plus or minus one and M equals M prime. Those are the net selection rules of everything coming from uh, proper as well as improper rotations. All right. Um, this is the standard selection rules for dipole matrix elements, which actually I've been over before already. Uh, the matrix elements that occur in the Stark effect are the same ones that occur in the radiated transitions, in, uh, which I talked about earlier in, in, uh, when uh, giving you examples of the bigger Eckhart. And it's the same example appearing again. All right, so in any case, it means the L and the L prime have to be different. And so you're certainly going to have zeros on the diagonal of this matrix because the L and L prime are, are equal in the diagonals. Also, these matrix elements, the matrix is for mission. This is a matrix of our mission operator. Uh, and in fact, it's actually real. So in fact, it's a symmetric matrix. So I only need to do one half of it and fill it in. So running across here, 2, 0, 0, and 2, 1, 0, the L has got a delta L equals 1. That's OK. And the M's are equal. So according to the selection rules, that could be non-zero. I'll indicate it by an X. However, 2, 0, 0, and 2, 1, 1, and 2, 1, minus 1 have to be 0 because the magnetic quantum numbers don't agree. So these vanish. On the second row, 2, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 0, again, they have to be 0 because of magnetic quantum numbers. As far as 2, 1, 1, and 2, 1, minus 1, that's also 0 for the same reason, magnetic quantum numbers. So now we'll just fill in the other side of it using the symmetry of the matrix, and it looks like this. And you see, of the 16 elements, there's only two that can be non-zero. In fact, they're equal to each other. It's really only one matrix element that's non-zero. They're equal because it's a symmetric matrix. And it's symmetric because it's a real emission matrix. It's real because the wave functions are real and because Z is real. So if I block diagonalize this matrix like this, there's a two by two block up here, which is just these two off diagonal elements, and everything else is zeros. All right. Now, um, I don't know if I want to erase this diagram, but I might need it later on. Um, well, maybe not, I guess. Um, so, um, so uh, what can we say now? So the energy shifts then are the eigenvalues of this 4 by 4 matrix. So this is the delta E. This is the energy shifts in N equals 2 levels of hydrogen due to the perturbation. You can see two of the eigenvalues are 0. And the other two eigenvalues are going to be the eigenvalues of this upper 2 by 2 matrix. Well, let me just, let's do some work and actually calculate matrix elements here. And X just means an entry that could be non-zero. Uh, actually, the entry itself is, is E times F times the scalar product of 2, 0, 0 on the left, the coordinate Z in the middle, and then 2, 1, 0 on the right. And uh, this turns out to be a negative number, so I'll write it as minus W, so that W is, it will be a positive number. And uh, I know this because I plugged in the wave functions, the YLMs, and the radial integrals, and I did the integral. Uh, and if you do that, what you find is, is that W is equal to 3 times the charge E times F times the mole radius A0. W is an energy. And you can see it's an energy which is of the order of magnitude necessary to move the electron from one side of the atom to the other in the external field. There's the charge, there's the distance, and there's the electric field. So EF is the force. It's really times a factor of 3, which comes mainly because these are N equals 2 uh, wave functions which are larger than the mole radius. But anyway, if you do the intervals, this is the answer you get. Let me just call it W. Uh, it's easier to write. And uh, as far as the x here, then I can replace these two things by a minus w and a minus w here. Uh, and w defined that way. And now if we compute the eigenvalues of this 2 by 2 matrix, which is easy to do, we find that they're both plus w and minus w. And so those are the energy shifts now computed by degenerate perturbation theory. Make a diagram if we started with the 2s and 2p levels, which are degenerate under, under the Hamiltonian H0. And then we go over to the full Hamiltonian H0 plus H1. We get a splitting diagram. I'm going to make room for this. We get a splitting diagram that looks like this. There's, uh, there's, there are two levels that remain the same. That's the 0, 0. And there's one level that goes up by plus w, and another level goes down by minus w, like this. As far as the two levels that remain the same, you can see which ones they are. They're the 2, 1, 1, and the 2, 1, minus 1 levels. 
because that's that's this, this lower block here. So this is the 211 and the 21 minus 1 levels. These are not affected by the perturbation. This is the 2p states for n equals plus and minus 1. All right. Um, so that's the energy level diagram uh, under the perturbation. Now, I'll come to the wave functions in a moment. But before I do that, I want to address some questions of symmetry that appear here. Um, this is the result of first order perturbation theory. But what we see is that the fourfold degeneracy is only partially lifted by this perturbation. Uh, there's two singlets, but there's still a doublet left over, so there's still some degeneracy left. This is the kind of thing that happens very frequently in, in studying perturbations of energy levels. Um, when something like this happens, you, you, are, you are led to wonder whether this, this degeneracy at first order perturbation theory is something that might be lifted if you went to higher order. First order perturbation theory is only an approximation. It's a first approximation. And so you wonder, would this be possibly be lifted at higher order, or would this degeneracy persist to all orders? Well, if the degeneracy persists to all orders, it, it almost certainly means that there's some symmetry of the full Hamiltonian, the full H0 plus H1. That's, this, would be, this would be the full Hamiltonian, which would be P squared over 2M plus R B naught of R plus R E F C. This is the full Hamiltonian now. Uh, the, um, uh, as I said, if there's some, uh, some degeneracy that persists to all orders, it's almost certainly a symmetry, represents the symmetry of the full Hamiltonian, the full perturbed Hamiltonian. It's a basic fact that in quantum mechanics, the degeneracies are associated with symmetries. And it's your key to recognizing symmetries. It's been very important in uh, discovering symmetries, this fact. Um, so um, let's take a look at the symmetries, both of H0 and of the full Hamiltonian H, which includes this extra term from the external electric field. And let's see what we can we can gather from that. So if I talk about H0 and H0 plus H1, uh, let's look at the symmetries. So first of all, what are the symmetries of H0? Well, it's a central force Hamiltonian, so it's got full rotational symmetry that is SO3, three-dimensional rotational symmetry. What else does it have? It's a, it's a metric of parity because all central force Hamiltonians are, are, uh, uh, are commute with parity. And furthermore, it commutes with time reversal because any uh, kinetic force potential Hamiltonian commutes with time reversal. It doesn't have to be a central force potential with Hamiltonian to do that. Remember, the way to break time reversal is magnetic fields. Uh, what about H0 plus H1? Well, it doesn't commute with all rotations anymore because the electric field is, is now giving us a preferred direction, which is the z direction. It's now, there's now a, a breaking of that symmetry. So in the z direction here, you've got this, this field F. <coughs> However, you still have a rotational symmetry about the z direction. And so that leaves an SO2, two-dimensional rotations about the, about the z axis. What about parity? Well, parity is certainly not a good quantum number anymore because the, the, the electric field indicates a preferred direction. If you flip plus e to minus e, it's not the same physics. So there's no parity anymore. This one goes away. And finally, what about time reversal? Well, time reversal, uh, any, any kinetic plus a potential Hamiltonian doesn't have to be central force. Uh, uh, commutes with time reversal. So we still have time reversal. So these are the, sy the symmetry of the perturbed system is less than the symmetry of the unperturbed system, but it still has some symmetry. SO2 here, by the way, is generated by LZ. It's the Z component of angular momentum, which generates rotations about the Z axis. So in terms of the interesting operators, they're LZ and theta for the fully, fully, uh, the fully uh, perturbed system. So let's try to do an analysis of the fully perturbed system, understanding symmetries, uh, without making any approximations. Uh, so what we've got is a full Hamiltonian H, and we've got an operator LZ that it commutes with. There aren't any others, actually. There's not any obvious ones anyway. In fact, there aren't any others. These are the obvious ones and all there is. You know, it's, it's usually true, if you find the obvious uh, symmetries, that they're the only ones that there are. Occasionally, there are some sneaky hidden ones that you wouldn't have suspected. And the most outstanding case of that is hydrogen, where there's actually an SO4 symmetry instead of an SO3. Um, it's, you know, it has more symmetry than your average uh, central force problem. Um, there's also extra symmetry to um, isotropic harmonic oscillators. Except for that, it's hard for me to think of any examples of where there's, uh, where there's extra or hidden or 
uh, hidden symmetry and stuff. So the normal rule is, is what, you, what, you, what is obvious is actually all there is. And that's the case here. These really are the only, LC is really, LC and, and time reversal are the only two symmetries that this whole model totally has. Well, in any case, since uh, these two operators commute, uh, they, of course, possess simultaneous eigenstates. Let's diagonalize LZ first. And uh, if we do it, it's called quantum number M. And we think that M equals 0, M equals 1, M equals minus 1, and so on, ranging from plus and minus infinity. I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just draw these first three in. Can I ask a question? Yeah, question? Uh, uh, so what's the fourth of the circle? What's the fourth in SO4? Well, this is a, the SO4 applies to hydrogen. Actually, it only applies to the electrostatic model of hydrogen. When you start putting in other details, it goes away. Um, the, it's, a, it's rotations in a four-dimensional space, but it's, uh, obviously it's not no physical space. So it's, it's an abstract space that's constructed on the operators of the hydrogen atom. And the hydrogen atom has extra operators that commute to the Hamiltonian. It's called the Rumble lens vector. And there's nothing that corresponds to the Rumble lens vector for your average central force problem. It's only for hydrogen. Yes? Um, have, is there any way to like, know that those are the only symmetries that apply the problem? Like, to be sure? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Is how do you know if there's real symmetries? Uh, actually, in classical mechanics, there's ways of finding out. Uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you, can, you, can, you can prove that there's no extra conserved quantities beyond a certain, uh, certain obvious set or a certain set. In quantum, in quantum mechanics, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a slightly, uh, uh, it's a different, it's a somewhat different question there. Maybe it's best to be discussing it in office hours, but it partly has to do with the matter of definition of what you actually mean by symmetry. Anyway, as a practical rule, what I'm saying is, is, a, is the way it works. All right. So, uh, so thinking of this exact system, suppose we diagonalize LZ first. Now what that gives us is a set of uh, breaks the Hilbert space up into in eigenspaces, which are the eigenspaces of LZ, corresponding to the different quantum numbers. In each one of these eigenspaces, then, we can diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And let me make a vertical axis to in indicate energy levels that we get when we do that. And so to get energy levels here, then I'll just draw them kind of, I'll draw them in as if they're random. They aren't random, actually, but just to make a drawing, let me just put some in. You get energy levels like this. So let's sequence them starting with, let's call it nu equals 1, nu equals 2, starting from more energy going on up. So what we get is energy levels, and let's call them nu and m, like this. And we have the fact that the Hamiltonian acts on this and brings out an energy, which in general must depend on both nu and m, like this. So those are our energy eigenstates, uh, indicated schematically in these, in these diagrams here. <coughs> These are also eigenstates of LZ, that LZ acts on U and it brings out M. Now the energy, we expect the energy to depend on M. The energy doesn't depend on M in, in rotationally invariant problems because M indicates the, the, the orientation of the system. But this is no longer rotationally invariant. We broke that by putting in the external field. So now we do expect the energies to depend on M. In fact, if you look at the result here, you see they do. These are, this is m equals 0, and this is m equals plus and minus 1. <coughs> All right. In any case, um, in any case uh, this is a, this, to proceed with this analysis of the exact system. Now, um, the, uh, unfortunately, I didn't leave myself enough room here to, to, to really do this. So let me move this up. And I'll do it just below it over here. So um, now let's a ask what does time reversal do? Let me remind you that if you have uh, if you have a an energy eigenstate of a of a Hamiltonian that commutes with time reversal, the time reversal will map the energy eigenstate into another into another state which is an energy eigenstate of the same energy. So in the present case, this means if I take theta and let it act on one of these new m states, this is an energy eigenstate of the same energy. So in particular, let the Hamiltonian act, and that brings out e new m. That's what energy does. Now, what about LZ? Let's try. Get, let's take LZ and apply it to theta LM, a new M, excuse me, like this. LZ and theta don't commute; they anti-commute because angular momenta are, um, are odd under under time reversal. So this turns into minus theta times LZ acting on new M, 
red brings out, Elsie brings out the M. The result is this is minus M times theta acting on nu M. So this theta acting on nu M is, is, a, is an eigenstate of energy with the same eigenvalue as nu M itself. However, the magnetic quantum number is changed as LZ is changed for the offset itself. What that means is, in this diagram up here, is that if we take one of these energy levels, let's say that U equals 1 here, with M equals 1, and we apply theta to it, it's, it's got to map it over into, a, into a, an eigenstate of the same energy on M equals minus 1. In other words, there must be an energy level here that reads with that one over there in energy. By the way, this level could have been degenerate, say it's twofold degenerate. And then theta applied to both of those, it gave you two levels over here of exactly the same energy, and vice versa. And so the result is, is although I didn't draw it this way, the energy levels on this n equals 1 must be exactly the same as the energy levels on this n equals minus 1. I can't really draw this very well, but that's what they've got to be. And so the energy actually only depends on the absolute value of m, and, there's, and, the, and the degeneracies are always, uh, always even in particular. At least they're at least equal to 2. There's at least a two-fold degeneracy. Now this argument doesn't work for m equals 0, because if I've got an m equals 0 level, then theta maps it into another m equals 0 level, it could be the same level. And so the argument does not, does not require that there be degeneracies of m equals 0, only for the values of m which are greater than 0. And if you look at our results from first order perturbation theory, this is exactly what we've got. We have a degeneracy here between m equals plus 1 and m equals minus 1. And this argument shows that this is exact. So although we got it in the first order perturbation theory, it actually applies to all orders. On the other hand, the w states are, uh, are, are eigenstates of, they're, they're eigenstates m equals 0, and uh, these are non degenerate. There's, they're, they're, the plus w minus w means there's two different energies. So on a diagram like this, we look like this. Here's the plus, here's the minus w, and here's the plus w. And the point is, these are non-degenerate integral zeros. All right. So those are some considerations of symmetry on the on the results of the exact Hamiltonian. All right. The, the energy levels on the m equals one and m equals minus one are always going to relate to each other. Uh, like not just for the new equals one, like you drew, but also new equals all, two. All of them. Yes, all of them. Because if you take any one of them and apply theta to it, you're going to get another uh, energy eigenstate of the same energy. But the m changes. So it's got to be a level over this side that's okay. the, the same energy. So then for each new, do you have a plus and minus w? So are there twice as many states on the m equals zero line that we no, no. Uh, I see. You're saying, are you saying because there's two here, there's two there? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Uh, as, as far as I, as far as I can see right now, I, I don't think that follows from from this analysis. Although I agree, it's what it looks, looks like in this example. So what right. would the new equals like? So would you have? Like, I guess what would the state above plus w be on that equals? Well, uh, this was the analysis of the n equals 2 level of hydrogen. Right. Uh, if we analyze the n equals 3 level, we get a, another diagram that would be more complicated because it's in nine states now. Okay. And, uh, but in there, in those, in those nine states, there would be n equals 1 levels. And they would have to be in, um, they would have to be twofold in general. Uh, so we don't have n equals 2 level. levels. And they're going to have to be twofold in general, too. But the m equals zero levels don't have to be. In fact, they're unlikely to be the proper symbols. Okay. Thanks. Okay. This is closely related to what's called lambda doubling in molecular physics, but since this is not chemistry, I won't tell you about that, but it's called lambda doubling. <coughs> All right. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Okay, so now, all right, so to go back to this perturbation analysis, then what I've done so far is to find that the, the, the shifts in the energy levels, which are here, and indicated by this diagram, so this diagram, the energy level diagram. Uh, we may also be interested in the wave functions, the eigenstates, uh, and just again, to remind you of the results of, of, of a degenerate perturbation theory, to get the eigenstates, we need to find the eigenvectors of this matrix. The eigenvectors give us the linear combinations 
of the unperturbed eigenstates, these are just the basis, it's just the basis of states in the unperturbed eigenspace. And certain linear combinations of them will be the uh, will be the eigenstates of the perturbed system. Well, it's easy to find the eigenvectors of this two by two matrix. Let me see if I can find some things to erase here and make room for it. Um, they will be the eigenvectors are this. There's two of them. You normalize them, it's one over the square root of two one one, and the other one's one over the square root of two one minus one. Easy enough to get. This part, the first one corresponds with the energy minus value, the second one corresponds to energy plus value. And so what we can get then, what we can say then is the states plus and minus W are linear combinations of these two states, 2, 0, 0, 2, 1, 0. They look like this, it's 1 over root 2 times uh, 2, 0, 0, and then it's a minus or a plus 2, 1, 0, like this. And um, so these are the exact eigenstates, well not exact, but these are the first order of perturbation theory, these are the eigenstates. Uh, in the presence of the perturbation, they're linear combinations of these two states with n equals zero. And they have different energies. Um, for lack of time, I won't bother doing a sketch, making sketches of the wave functions, but let me just say that if you write out the wave functions for these two states and add and subtract the wave functions and then square them to get probabilities or charge densities, you'll find that the state with plus W has a charge moved against the electric field and it's shifted against the electric field. Basically, the atom becomes polarized by the electric field, either with or, or, or against it, depending on, on which of the two signs you have. And uh, this would come out of a contour plot of the wave function, the net wave function of the perturbed system. It would be nice to have a diagram of it so you can see that. All right. Now, um, so that's uh, just some remarks about the uh, energy eigenstates. Let me say something uh, now about some interesting physics connected with these n equals two levels. You can do it on this board here. Uh, in hydrogen, you have the 1s, you've got the 2s and the 2p, and then the 3s and the 3p and the 3d, like this, and so on in higher states. Uh, the dipole radi radiated transition rules require delta L equals plus and minus 1. So you get a transition like this, and one like this, and you can get one like this, and you get one like this, and you can get one like this. Uh, but there's nothing in taking you from the 2s to the 1s. And so if you take a, a population of hydrogen atoms, and you do something to knock them into a, into a collection of excited states, you could do this with a, um, an electron beam. Uh, let's say up to n equals 3 or 4, then what will happen is, is they'll start undergoing radiated transition rattling down following these arrows like a, pin, like a pinball machine. And um, they, after a while, they'll either end up in the 1s state, which is the ground state, or else they'll end up in the 2s state, which is metastable. Uh, the time, uh, transition time for the 2p to 1s is a dipole transition that goes in about 10 to the minus 9 seconds. When the 2s state is stuck there, and it has to go by a higher order transition, we'll talk about later on next semester, and it takes a much longer time, it's about 10 to minus 1 second, about 100, 100 million times longer than, than the 2p to 1s, 1s transition. Now the 2s state, if I write it in terms of the NLM quantum numbers, is the 200 state. And this is an eigenstate of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. But if we turn on the electric field, it is not an eigenstate of the, of the perturbed system because those eigenstates are plus and minus W, which since it's now covered up, I have to re re rewrite it. It's the uh, 2, 0, 0 minus or plus the 2, 1, 0, like this. So in the presence of the electric field, the 2, 0, 0 is no longer an energy eigenstate. It's a linear combination of plus W and minus W. And those two components don't evolve at the same frequency because they have different energies. There's a delta E, the energy between the two, which is equal to twice W. And so if you look at the time, relative time evolution of the two components, plus and minus W, of this state, it goes by E to the minus I is delta E of T over H bar. And the result of this is, is that you get an oscillation in probability between the 2S and the 2P. It swings back and forth between these two as a function of time. Or more exactly, that's what it would do if there were no radiated transitions. But since there are radiated transitions, as soon as, as soon as some of the 2p, excuse me, some of the 2s state gets shifted over to the 2p, it rapidly in a period of 10 to the minus 9 second, nanosecond drops down into the ground state, emitting photons. 
So the result is if you create this population of, of metastable 2S hydrogen, and then you turn the switch to click on an electric field, what happens is, is all of a sudden you get a lot of photons emitted and they all drop down to the ground so it's a big burst of photons comes out. This is some, uh, some uh, physics connected to this. All right. Now, um, the, um, uh, now then, let me go back to this. Uh, I want to go back to the ground state of hydrogen, which is, is here, as a matter of fact. We found that the first order energy shift was zero. Uh, there's no linear Stark effect, as we, as we say, in the ground state of hydrogen. Uh, but the question is, um, if there's no energy shift, what about the wave function? Is there a shift in the wave function? So let's look at that question now. What is the, I mean, if you just think of it, think of it, uh, uh, physically, it's, it's clear there should be because the normal state of hydrogen is a, is a spherical is a symmetric uh, a distribution of charge like this. And if you put an electric field going in one direction, then the electrons get pushed that way, the proton that way, and it should turn into something that kind of looks like this. The plus sign here and the minus sign there. So it turns in, you should get a dipole moment vector that looks like this, you see, pointing in the same direction as the electric field. So this dipole moment vector, this is called an induced dipole moment. As I explained earlier, there is no permanent electric dipole moment in the ground state, but in the presence of an external field, it acquires one, and that's what's called the induced dipole moment. Now, under some circumstances, the induced dipole moment is proportional to the applied electric field, and the proportionality constant is called alpha, and it's given the name of polarizability. This is the definition of polarizability. It's just a proportionality factor. Uh, okay. So uh, let's try to analyze this from the standpoint of quantum mechanics. According to first order perturbation theory, the shift in the, the, the perturbed, the perturbed uh, wave function, this is, this is actually a non-degenerate perturbation theory now, the shift in the wave function is, well, the, the original wave function was the ground state 1, 0, 0, and applying the formula for the first correction, what you get is a sum over all states in LM which are not equal to the ground state 1, 0, 0, all the states except for the 1 that you're being perturbed. And you get a linear combination of states in LM. These are states orthogonal to the original state. And this is multiplied times in LM, perturbing Hamiltonian H1, the original state, the H, H, uh, uh, ground state. And then you have an energy denominator, which is E1 minus Em, like this, because in hydrogen, the energy is only dependent on the principal quantum numbers. So this is just a formula straight from perturbation theory. Now, uh, what about the, uh, now the question arises, what about the uh, dipole moment of the state in the presence of the electric field? From this picture here, it looks like there should be one. So let's compute psi sandwiched around the dipole moment operator, which is minus e. I'll just take the z component of it, minus dz, psi like this. What about this expectation value? So what I need to do is to take this sum here as a cat on this side, and this sum is a bra on that side. And you'll see there'll be four terms. This sum here, however, is a, is a first order correction. The one zero zero on both sides gives us zero, and that was this calculation up above, so that doesn't contribute. There's going to be two cross terms. They're actually equal to each other because these are all real matrix solvents. And then the last one would be a second order where I've got the sum on both sides and I'll ignore that because we just worked the first order. So the result is there's a factor of two because of the two cross terms. There's a factor of minus E from this constant here. From H1, which is equal to EFZ, there's a factor of EF, which I'll take out. That's, that's another constant. As far as E1 minus EN is concerned, let me write this as minus EN minus E1 because the energies are increasing functions of n, and that way I'll have a positive denominator. So let me take out the minus 1 that comes from there. And then what's left over, let me call it s, which is a sum. So s here is a sum, and this is equal to the sum on nlm not equal to 1, 0, 0. And uh, then what we need to do is take 1, 0, 0 as a bra. I need to put in the minus ez, or just z now, because everything else is taken out. So it turns into this, it becomes 1, 0, 0, Z, N, L, M, times N, L, M, Z, 1, 0, 0, same matrix only written backwards, divided by E, N, minus E, 1. Just take that as a sum. 
So this turns into true b squared f times the sum s. And I'm sorry I heard the bell. Let me just do one more thing and I'll let you go. And that is, is that this definition of polarizability, if you take the z component of it, kz is equal to alpha fc. fc is the same thing as what I'm calling this f here. You see the polarizability now can be read off. This is the dipole, this is the di z component of the dipole moment. So the polarizability is the coefficient of, of f. It's everything else except for f here. So what we get is alpha is equal to twice e squared times this sum s. Like this, where s is going to be down here by this sum. And this is an example of how atomic polarizabilities can be calculated for quantum mechanics. Um, this uh, easily leads you to the, uh, the dielectric constant of the, uh, of the material. Um, it's a little unrealistic in this case because nobody has a gas of hydrogen atoms. You always have hydrogen molecules. But at least it illustrates the principle of how uh, electric susceptibilities can be calculated in first principles. Okay, so I'll see you tomorrow morning and we'll uh, continue with this. I hope, I hope to finish our practice tonight.